trying to explain how we, how you get to get the archives up in Manchester, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, how, how yeah. it came to be. And uh, and obviously you're part of that process. Yeah, so we um, once all the agreements were in place, yeah, I was saying that the BBC obviously retained exploitation rights of the stuff that belonged to them, that was mm. you know, BBC productions. And where it starts to get really messy is that, so you've got the stuff which isn't by Delia, which is in the, uh, the tape archive. Then you've got BBC Project. Then most of it is like freelance work. And she's doing music and sound design for theatre, uh, film. Uh, there's a feature film starring Scylla Black and David Warner called Work is a Four Letter Word. I don't, have I ever seen it? No, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I can't <laughs> say I have. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> Utterly bizarre. I think it's floating around on YouTube. It's basically about these magic mushrooms, which these people... David Warner is growing these mushrooms and they've got, you know, uh, mind expanding properties. And Delia does the sound of the effect of the mushrooms on, Black. On, on, on people. Scylla Black in one of her few feature film roles. And she did a tie in song for it as well. The way the Radio Front Workshop turns up on a number of films in the 60s, again, often not credited. So there's things mm. like The Ipcrest File. All right. With, with, you know, with Michael Caine. Yes. No, the sound of the machine in The Ipcrest File. So again, you know, it's sort of like so you know, Foley sound. That's all Foley sound, then, isn't it? Uh, it's yeah. radiophonic. It's radiophonic workshop sound yeah. done by. Uh, I, I asked Brian Hodge, and I said, "Did you do the special sound for that particular, you know, the machine?" And he said, "Yes, that that, that was him." And <laughs> the other thing that that Brian did was the uh, the laser beam from uh, Goldfinger. Um, oh, you yeah. know, the first one where. Ah. You know, do, do, do you expect me to talk? No, I expect you to die. You know, that the laser beam that's Brian, you know, so but they didn't get credited no. for that. No, so, no. so they, wrong. um, you know, they're often, you know, if you're making a film in Britain at that time and you want some electronic sound, the people you would go to would be, if not the Radiophonic Workshop, then Tristram Carey or Daphne Oren, you know, who were setting themselves up mm. with private studios, uh, and they had the gear. Uh, as well to generate their own, their own mm. sound. So, um, yeah, so she's doing the occasional feature film, more independent, sort of like experimental avant-garde films, lots of live kind of like happenings and installations. And she does the first edition of the Brighton Festival, which was done with um, Hornsey College. They did a thing called K4, Kinetic 4 Dimensional. And it was uh, 1967, first edition, Pink Floyd are there. I was going to mention that the, there's, there's always been possible link with Delia Derbyshire and Pink Floyd and the Beatles, of course. The yeah, Carnivore, the, the, Carnivore the, Light. The Million Volt Sound and Light Rave, I think. That was at the Roundhouse. Yes. And that oh. was, yeah, so that was, that was a live happening. And so at that point, Delia was working as well as, you know, her, her day job at the BBC. She had this um, group, Unit Delta Plus, that's Peter Zinoffier, mm. Brian Hodgson and Delia. And they're doing like, you know, all kinds of freelance projects. And one of the things that they contributed to was that event at the Roundhouse. Depending on who you ask, they didn't actually have that much input into it. So I interviewed Brian a few years ago, and Brian said basically all he remembered about it was that they took some tips down to the Roundhouse. He described it pretty much as mayhem. Nobody really knew what they were doing. So they dropped the tips off and went to the pub and let them get on with it, according to Brian. Paul McCartney had gone to um, Zinoffiev's studio, he, he shed in Putney, where he had sort of like this kind of really sort of like, he was doing like computer, computer music. Delia would work there as well. Talked to Peter and Delia, and McCartney says that he was played some tracks by Zinoffiev of work that he and Delia had been doing, which we don't know what that is. I think it's a piece called Random Together, which uh, Delia and Peter did. Pretty groundbreaking event, actually. They did a concert in 1966 at the Watermill Theatre uh, at Bagner, just before the Watermill became a, a sort of professional theatre space, you know, performance space. Yeah. So, and Delia, Peter and Brian organised this concert of electronic music at which there would be visual projections by uh, Horns Ecology's Light and Sound Workshop, who Delia had good collaboration with. She did the, the Brighton uh, immersive installation space you could go into. And um, so... These are kind of like abstract images, colours, lights, and they had all kinds of plans what they were going to do there. I mean, in, in the archive, there's letters where Delia and Hornsey College are talking about how they were going to do playback extract one of Delia's pieces called Amor Day. Beautiful piece with Barry Bamonge of people talking about their belief or non-belief in, in God. Uh, just everyday people just talking about that. I, I think... Delia, 
I think I've heard that. Was it John Cavanna? He interviewed her. Uh, yeah. I, I follow him on Facebook yeah. now. Yeah, because I think he interviewed Caro C, which we'll come up to a bit later. Yeah, so that was a sort of fairly interesting uh, interview he did with her about 20, 25 years ago, I think. Yeah, it wasn't that long yeah. before. It was, it was just a few years before she yeah, died. Uh, yeah. So it's uh, Drew Mulholland is, is on that interview. Mm. And then uh, I think it's John Kavanagh. Kavanagh. Yeah, so that was four pieces she did with Barry Bamonge mm. called Inventions for Radio. The most famous one that a lot of people listening to this might know is The Dreams. And that's that's people talking about the dreams experience. Mm. Mm. But they're, they're doing it in the first person as if it's happening. So there's, you know, I'm, I'm running up a corridor and, being, and, and a crocodile's chasing me and I'm falling and my clothes are dragging me back. All these different voices oh. spliced together to make it sound like they're all sharing one giant collective mm. dream it's it, it's quite i think it's quite subversive because you get these different accents you get working class accents you get you know people from different kind of economic background and they've been spliced together in such a way so it sounds like there's this shared dream mm. you know unconscious that we're all plugging into which is a bit you know it's, it's a bit radical for the 1960s yeah. and the bb the bbc got complaints from you always want to say like they're disgusted from tunbridge wells as that's the only place where <laughs> yeah. people are disgusted yeah. from you know there were there were people writing at the bbc and complaining about the accents harsh guttural accents people dropping their hitches didn't like the fact that they would you know who are these inane non-entities talking about what is god or getting old or dreams and things like that so i mean it's fascinating because it it shows you that there was still that snobbery yeah, uh, yeah. that kind of like class um and that hasn't changed until very recent i think you do get a lot of more regional accents on tv now which is great rather than that the stiff upper lip english accent the sort of the harry enfield type of accent you, yeah. <laughs> you take off yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but i mean we, we we just had it during the olympics haven't we with the the peer i don't know was, was it lord digby something digby jones and he was mm. just complaining just this last week he tweeted about one of the commentators because of her accent yeah. i can't remember where we were, she was from was it essex i think you know so it's still there that kind of that kind of stigma that you know mm. certain voices shouldn't be um, heard on the nation's mm. airway yes yeah, so, so so we get to the point where the archive is in place i think that's this is where as you say was it about 2008 it was a sort of announced by the bbc is there and then people start taking note i think this is where the sort of the tsunami where it starts to build and say you know doctor who theme delia derbyshire all these archives and i, I think this is where the sort of the public start to really get to know who she is i, th I think it's been part of it i, th I think it was already happening and, and i think the archive really just enabled that to mm. you know like really pushed it even even more so yeah i mean i remember when you know it came to Manchester 2007 and that first summer was basically spent digitizing the tapes with one exception there was one tape we couldn't play because it was just in such a bad condition and that was done with lewis neighbor who's a mm. An academic from the United States, and Lewis is a specialist on British electronic music in particular in the Radio Funk mm. Workshop. The, obviously, we're at the same time, the internet's changing and it's really getting out there to people across the world. If it was 10 years earlier, it would have been a slow burner, I guess, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was. You know, and, yeah. and actually, I mean, the, the internet is, you know, and, and there's been some, you know, brilliant work done by people who've been, you know, re rededicated to, you know, to Delia, mm. you know, on the internet. And there's things where certainly the archive has benefited from that knowledge you know being shared i know there's a lot of people want the archive to be all there freely on you know on the internet for you know, anybody to access both the sounds and the um uh, the, you know the paper documents as well and, and then there are very good reasons why that's not being able to happen and obviously the copyright issue mm. with the, the sound archive but with the paper archive so i'm actually just to just to say a little bit more about that on the copyright with a lot of delia's freelance projects when you listen to the tapes it becomes very clear that she's doing a lot of repurposing her own back catalogue and so there's a lot of times where she's taking sounds and cues for bbc productions and then in some cases dropping them into some theater work and not doing anything much to it and then other instances where she takes some of those makeup elements and then transforms them into a new configuration but then that gets you into this really murky territory of well if, if those were bbc sounds and bbc cues recorded on bbc premises using bbc equipment for bbc productions where the bbc in that uh, in terms of the copyright so that's been really i think a long drawn out slow process to and work out will that ever be let free into to the internet where it's like the uh, the 70 year copyright uh, well so of course, of course it will vary from piece to piece that's in the yeah. archive so you yeah. know there are things which are nothing to do with the bbc and that is you know that that's original material that, that delia has made then that's the kind of thing that i think could be looked to put out there now that's not the university's job to do that mm. that's for people to come 
to the archive of the proposal, we were entrusted with it to catalog it and to preserve it and to raise raise awareness about it, but not to make any money off it. No, um, no, no. So um, I, I know for a fact that Marquez, and I mean, I think there are at least two albums in there. One would be, you know, if I was going to call it something, you'd call it the Delian stage, and it would be Delia's music for theatre and musicals. Mm. And then you could have another album, which would be the Delian screen. I'm, I'm just throwing these these names on the top. Sound of my good, head. yeah. But but you know, but but that would be like work that she did for independent films. Mm. So you know, you could certainly get, I think, two really rewarding, exciting compilations from that. So a lot of the the kind of material as well is not final master so a lot of the tapes in there it's all the component parts gradually being you know slowly mm. transformed into so something it's, yeah it's like working pro like i do on my door you, <laughs> you put things together and think, oh i'll go away and leave that and then you might just not go back to it so that i guess it's all like little sketches aren't they musical sketches it is you know and i mean yeah. that you know that does raise a question of do we have the right to put that material out if those are working mm. progress sketches that the artist hasn't necessarily said they want that to be released you know it's like when you you hear you know some of those recordings of charlie parker in you know the early 1950s and it's all the false starts and somewhere he's really not well and some of that's incredibly moving you know you're knowing where he's at at that point with you know his health and his use of narcotics at that you know at that time and of course it's really interesting mm. if you want to know the full story but then there's something about the integrity of the artist and you know like kafka didn't want his stuff out there and, you know he was off like having it destroyed and, and it was salvaged 